Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is T.R. Stoner, and um, I'll give you a little introduction uh, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm new to the broadcast industry. I've only been working in broadcast since May. I've been a uh, practicing RF engineer for, I guess, about 30 years now. Spent the first eight years of my career in land mobile radio and 20-plus years in the wireless industry. Um, a few with Motorola and the rest were with a uh, local telecom company, Cincinnati Bell. I was the Director of Radio Access Network Engineering at Cincinnati Bell Wireless. So I guess the question some might have is, is why would someone go from the wireless industry to the broadcast industry? And <clears throat> so I think I think both industries are faced with some very very interesting business problems and business challenges. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in the wireless industry. As in the last three years of my career, one of the toughest ones um, we were dealing with was um, managing traffic, the explosive growth of data traffic on our networks, and um, the immense amount of capex and infrastructure build that required. So, um, some, you know, uh, broadcast is also a very interesting point, and there's a, there's a convergence of some technology and, and business problems and solutions that make it a very interesting place to be, someone in the, in the broadcast industry with a wireless background. So that's kind of the story there. What I want to talk about today is um, a little bit about what's going on in, in the mobile industry and what, what the implications are for broadcasters and what, what are some of those common business problems and strategies and things that can be exploited um, to create business opportunities for broadcasters. First background, talk a little bit about what's going on in the mobile industry. Oh, by the way, by the way of comments here, I wanted to encourage people just to ask questions as, as I go along. We don't, don't have to wait till the end. Um, I always kind of view it as a successful presentation if I don't get to the last slide, so it's not, not that critical we get all the way through this. Just give you a little bit of background about what's going on in the mobile industry and uh, industry trends. First of all, in terms of scale, the, the Tier 1 U.S. carriers, this is two, their 2014 revenues were $184 billion. Uh, they spend about $32, uh, 32 billion a year in CapEx combined. Just a few uh, bullet points, actually. Ver Verizon's CapEx in 2015 was up 11%. Industry CapEx, though, was down 8%. And there's kind of a forecast that, that CapEx in the wireless industry has to come down because the CapEx spend isn't really sustainable. You see a pretty good jump in CapEx at the beginning of 2013 as the LTE deployments really, really came online and um, with, with the growth of video. So some of, the, some of the things you see, again, explosive growth in data traffic. Uh, 2016, we should see 70% of the traffic on mobile networks will be video-based. Um, proliferation of the over-the-top services, uh, Facebook, Net Netflix, a lot of video and messaging services. Um, those over-the-top services are a real kind of a double-edged sword for the industry. Uh, they're, they're very popular with subscribers, but the carriers don't make any money on them. Uh, it's, it's a big issue for Verizon, AT&T, for Cincinnati Bell, it's a big issue. Didn't make any money on any of those services, yet it drove a tremendous amount of capex in our networks. Most of the capex being spent is to provide a pipe for these services that really uh, we're, we're, there's no revenue growth from them. So, um, so you have these increasing operator operator costs. Not only capex, there's a lot of opex that goes along with that. Uh, small cells require backhaul, transport, site leases technical staff to maintain them, a lot of work to try to get operating costs down, but, but there's also OPEX that, that comes along with this traffic. Subscriber growth is slowing, so the real impetus for, for the initial LTE deployment was to migrate people from their old um, 2G devices, which were very voice and text centric, up to the smartphones. And typically there was a bolt-on data plan, so, so the, the operators got another 10 or 12 bucks of ARPU out of it uh, when they when they got someone to upgrade. Uh, now there's a lot of competition and pricing pressure. T-Mobile has been out there for probably almost two and a half years now competing very successfully on on price. They've been growing dramatically. Um, their, their margins are, are lower their, than their competitors but it's been helping their bottom line. And um, you know, AT&T and Verizon didn't respond initially, didn't view it as, as a threat. That's what they were telling their analysts. And now, now they're kind of in a position where they, they see this going on. Yeah, Sprint might jump into this game if they can ever find the capital to upgrade their network. Sprint, Sprint's not in great financial shape. So that, that, those are, that's kind of the backdrop. 
backdrop. So that's driving a need for new business models for wireless carriers. They're out there trying to change their traditional business model. Um, they, they're looking to find ways of monetizing over-the-top services. How do we get a cut of the revenue when Facebook does an ad that goes over our network? We're not getting anything from that. They're going to be constrained. They, they, you know, the first business models envisioned for that had to do with things like um, uh, providing different quality of service levels. So if they could, you know, they were going to essentially um, guarantee um, latency and jitter and things like that for um, for Netflix if Netflix, if Netflix would pay Verizon or AT&T a fee. And but net neutrality kind of threw that whole model upside down and um, it's not gone away. There's you know you know the net neutrality is working its way through the courts. The some of the wireless carriers are very confident that it will get tossed by the courts. But that that business model now is very much at risk. So they're focusing on other business models. Um, there's a lot of look at doing advertising and data analytics. Uh, mo you know your mobile operator might insert its own ads when you're on fa Facebook. You might see some of, some of their content come up. Um, they're going to be trying to do more context aware. One of the things driving Google and Facebook to encrypt everything is, is they don't really want the mobile operators looking at, at what their subscribers are doing. Uh, but there's still a lot of analytics you can collect. The uh, banking, obviously, with uh, you know your Apple Pay's out there, but there's a lot of other services for e-wallet, uh, financial transaction processing. Those are all things the wireless carriers want to get into. And then and then the machine-to-machine -machine communications are, are which recently has been labeled Internet of Things or IoT. So specifically, uh, there is new wireless standards. 3GPP release 12 introduces a new class of telemetry devices in LTE designed for lower bandwidth connections, um, more robust radio links so you can commu communicate with um, telemetry devices that may be far from the cell site. There's an example there, like maximum throughput, 1 megabits per second, a 15 dB improvement in link budget, um, a lot of it, extensions to the air interface, like uh, extended sleep modes to maximize battery life. The idea is, is hey, I can read, I can put a water meter, uh, you know, the, uh, with a five-year or ten-year battery in there, and then I can, can get telemetry from these these meters. So, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what wireless providers, um, the technology kits in their tool bag, what what, what they're doing. Um, a lot of talk about LTE broadcast, which uh, is kind of a, a common name for EMBMS, um, which is a multimedia broadcast multicast service. I don't know why they had to put multi in there twice. But the, <laughs> the whole concept behind this technology, and, and really what's, what the enhanced piece of it is, this is, this is a technology that Verizon has now deployed. AT&T has partially deployed it. The whole concept behind this, though, is, is that the cell site, uh, there's intelligence in a cell site so that it can detect if a user is streaming content, uh, if multiple users are, you know, are streaming the same real-time content and dynamically switch them from unicast to multicast, uh, thereby eliminating the packet duplication. Sounds, you know, sounds really powerful, um, but until you realize that all, with all the wireless carriers, and I, I kind of saw this as we, you know, in real time, I've got a, I had a lot of gear at Paul Brown Stadium and kind of saw some of this effect. But as you make so cell sites smaller and smaller and smaller, the, the, the probability of having enough users on a cell in close enough proximity streaming the same content in real time synchronously gets smaller and smaller. So the actual number of connections you, you, uh, you, that, that flip into multicast mode is, is the issue here. It's not, it's not a high percentage. I even saw a study from the Super Bowl in 2013 where they said typically um, they had put so many they had put so many small cells in the, in the Super Bowl uh, venue. I think that one was up in New York that they typically had no more than three users watching the same content at a time. So they only had three users. So was, the gain from multicasting wasn't huge, and there's some overhead with it too. So that that's what LTE broadcast is all about. Verizon actually uh, last week was saying they're not you know. LTE broadcast is not driving a, a lot of business for them, and they're actually thinking about repurposing um, the technology for telematics, and they want to look at using that to do automated software downloads, particularly with vehicles. Um, the telematics space with, with vehicles is, a, is, is an area of hot growth right now. A lot of vehicles are LTE connected with LTE gateways in them. 
Um, small cells, another, uh, another technology being deployed. Uh, last year, in 2015, 2016, almost all the major operators targeted the deployment of about 50,000 small cells. I've got a picture of a small cell. Uh, those of you in the Cincinnati area, that's right in front of Jungle Gyms. Um, that was a small cell, that's a Verizon small cell that was actually built by the local Cincinnati Bell engineering team that I, I used to work with. And, um, you know, the idea is by deploying about 50,000 of these small cells in the right area, they're cheaper to build than macro cells, but they can, um, uh, they can get a 50 to 100 percent increase in network capacity by strategically deploying small cells near hotspot areas. There, there are actually, this is what's called a metro cell. It's, a, it's an outdoor small cell, has a couple hundred meter range, target range. Um, but has a 700 megahertz band on there. You can probably get up to half mile. But um, there's also other types of small cell technology. There's really three different classes. There's the femto cell, which is kind of an in-home small cell, very much like a Wi-Fi access point, except it operates on licensed frequencies. Those have limited functionality. They typically don't support the higher burst speeds. Um, they're limited by your broadband connection. And often they don't support handover, which can be a real, real limitation. If you're on a call, you, you may drop it when you, when you get out of, the small, out of the range of it. There's the enterprise class small cell, which are also pretty popular. Um, when I was at Cincinnati Bell, we actually had more enterprise class small cell cells deployed in the city than we had um, macro, macro site networks. But those, those support full functionality. Um, again, they use uh, just an IP connection. They support handovers um, and are much more capable devices. They're also, they also can provide a managed quality of service, which you can't do with the Femto cell. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is this, this move to distributed radio architectures. Um, with distributed radio architectures, up in the top graph there, you see that that there's the, what we call a remote radio head at the, at the cell site. Um, the remote radio head. Originally, this technology was just designed to eliminate coax. The, the whole thought was, is, uh, you know, the, the wind loading and cost of coax, if I could just get rid of the coax, I can save a lot of money. Uh, typically, with the antenna counts getting very high on these, on these uh, cell sites, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't afford to run a coax for every antenna anymore. So they, they ran fiber up the tower. They put the power amplifier in uh, D to A and L and A and A to D um, all up on top. And then they took the IQ data down over the fiber. So that's the concept here is, is you extend that fiber connection. You consolidate all the baseband processing, usually at a, at a telco central office. You put all your baseband processing equipment there, and you run fiber out to the cell sites. Um, the, the toughest part of this technology right now is this CIPRI interface. It, uh, it's sending IQ data. It's sending waveforms. If you have 50 megahertz worth of bandwidth being digitized, it's a lot of bandwidth. That CIPRI interface goes all the way up to 9 gigabits per second. And fiber, fiber availability that can support those kind of rates is, is, um, is somewhat limited even for the, the Verizons and AT&Ts out there. But, but, but it's a very important technology uh, because it involves it allows next generation interference cancellation algorithms. Um, it allows um, the easier implementation of beam forming antennas and other, and other advanced SDR capabilities. So down here in the chart is, is going back to this number where I said carriers who are trying to deploy in the US about 50,000 small cells hope to double their network capacity. This bottom chart here is just kind of a graph of how much this is a Qualcomm kind of calculation of how much you could increase cell capacity with uh, very well-placed small cells inside of a sector. And they, they have gains all the way up there to 37. A little bit difficult to realize that in practice. But theoretically, those are the types of gains you can, you can get with small cell in network capacity. Now I'm going to jump a little bit uh, up to 5G. The industry is all talking about 5G. Um, the vendors are already starting to fight about what is 5G and what is not 5G, just like they did when um, T-Mobile called their uh, HSPA technology 4G and everyone was complaining, that's not LTE, you can't call it 4G. But, so, so those fights are already, are, are already going on. And there's a lot of interesting components with 5G technology. I, I, I really view it as a 2020 plus event. It, it, it involves a pretty significant technological leap. It's not as evolutionary as LTE was. LTE was really fairly evolutionary technology. It, it, 
It was deploying technologies that had been used in other industries and, and were somewhat mature. Um, 5G is not using mature technologies by any, any stretch of the mean. A lot of these are new technologies, and, and it, you know, there's a lot of risk around, around these, these technologies. So one of the key things here is this concept of Cloud RAN. Cloud RAN is, very, is the next generation of that distributed radio architecture. The whole idea behind Cloud RAN is, as I mentioned, you put your baseband processing like in a telephone company central office. Here, here what you do is, is you migrate to COTS hardware. You just use blade servers um, and, do all your, and do all your digital signal processing on standard blade server type architectures. Um, so everything becomes very, truly software defined at that point in time, and you can implement, um, you know, thousands of cell sites worth of baseband processing just in a in a couple racks. The advan the reason you need to do that is that if you're going to enable any of these advanced software defined radio algorithms like joint detection, interference cancellation, the the one at the bottom called coordinated multipoint transmission is where you where essentially you transmit the same data redundantly on coded waveforms from multiple transmit sites to improve link budget and, and link robustness. Um, all the cell sites have to share waveform data. They have to share that IQ data. And if every cell site in the network needs to know the IQ data of every other cell site so it can look at the, the, um, the spectrum, uh, both on uplink and downlink, you have to have a huge amount of bandwidth between all the cell sites. And, and, that, and LTE has that X2 interface designed for sharing data in between cell sites. It's used for frequency coordination and um, this coordinated multipoint transmission scheme uses that X2 interface. It just doesn't scale for a lot of these algorithms. Um, and that's what the driver of why you need to put all the baseband processing in one location for, all this, for a large number of cell sites in a, in a cluster. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit now about um, some of the other key 5G. Millimeter wave radio is a, is a key um, topic in 5G. A lot of the research on the millimeter wave radio propagation and its viability in a mobile environment is, is being done at by uh, the NYU Wireless Lab, Ted Rappaport, if you, you know who Ted Rappaport is. Um, his group up there has, has been doing a lot of pioneering work. There, and, and, and quite frankly, there's a pretty good co uh, consensus of opinion now that the millimeter wave bands are viable for mobile links with some limitations. Um, most of the work's being done in dense urban environments, so this is not a technology you'll see in rural areas. Uh, if you see it in residential areas, it will probably just be a millimeter wave link from a, from a phone pole mounted antenna to your house, and then you'll probably have to have some kind of window unit because you, you obviously can't do wall, you know, penetrate a wall uh, in the millimeter wave bands. Um, so they're doing a lot of work on this technology. Uh, some things that come along with that, massive MIMO then becomes practical technology, and I'll, I'll give a little example of, of some of the things that are being done with massive MIMO. These require very large antenna arrays, up to hundreds of antennas at a base station, and you know, 10, 20, 30 antennas in the mobile device in order to make that, that technology work. And again, joint, joint detection. Um, some people, some people classify joint detection and massive, massive MIMO together. So this is actually quite an old slide by now. This is a 2013 slide. Um, this was a Sam, built by Samsung. And this is a, um, a demonstration of a 5G a demonstrator um, system for 5G wireless links. On the base station, they've got a, an array that's uh, 8 by 8 antennas, 64 antennas. Um, you see that's uh, uh, 66 millimeters there, so with about uh, two and a half inches by two and a half inches. Um, and then the mobile there, they had a, an antenna array that was uh, 44 millimeters by 51 millimeters, so two inches by one and three quarters, something like that. Uh, it was at 28 gigahertz, um, 500 megahertz channel bandwidth. And in 2013, they were able to do a gigabit per second on a mobile link, two, kilom two kilometer shot, well, for a mobile in motion. Um, stationary, they were over 10 gigabits per second um, in a stationary environment. So the mobile and the transmitter, they have actively beam steered antennas. They have about 13 dB a gain. The whole idea behind this is to try to get um, you know, the you know, antenna aperture shrinks as you go down in wavelength. They're trying to get the antenna aperture back up to 
what it would be at the lower frequency bands and get similar type link budgets by putting these very high gain uh, antennas. Beam steering is necessary and very complicated. If you think about trying to beam steer something like that, someone holding a mobile device, you know, you can't the body loss is too high. You can't maintain a link through the body, so it has to you have to have kind of a line of sight to a building face so you can bounce a signal off of. As you move around, the beam's got to continually steer and track. A um, lot of complexity to it. A lot of um, you know, a lot of silicon that's going to be required to make this work that uh, is, is really going to be pushing new technology. So it'll be interesting to see if this technology comes to market as the futurists are, are predicting or whether there'll be some stumbles along the road. Who's the, who's the target for that technology? Well, that's another, that's a very other interesting question. I mean, the, the, you know, the marketers out there get all excited about these numbers because it's an easy number to communicate to consumers and gets consumers excited. Um, what, what applications are out there that require gigabit per second? So there, there's two. There's not only gigabits per second, but something that is very useful for consumer applications is the latencies come way down. They're talking one millisecond latency, or le you know, I mean, think about one millisecond latency or less than one millisecond. Uh, you know, not, now your over-the-air propagation time starts to come into play because you're talking about a one millisecond round trip. Um, it, that's probably the most one of the most challenging specs to me is that one millisecond round trip time. But that gives you, you know, that gives you the interactivity you need for virtual reality type applications. So virtual reality is one of those things that throw out there. A lot of this is based on app, you know, a lot of people say, well, the applications don't exist yet, but people will invent them. Um, the, the other thing is, is you know, these, this bandwidth is shared among multiple users, so it doesn't necessarily mean that a user needs to maintain a one gigabit per second link. It might mean that you're at a football stadium and you're serving 300 users in a section of seating with a one gigabit per second link, and that way they can stream their video. So that, that's not the, the only use case is not just one, one user. The, the other thing, too, is, is um, this tech, the millimeter wave technology is being targeted very much for off the, the cube farm inside the office, replace all the cabling in the building. So, so now that you know, all that wired infrastructure in the buildings goes away and everything's wireless. Um, as, you know, you just you, you obviously have to run fiber to these wireless access points to make that, that kind of stuff happen. But that, and then you can serve the whole office space where you, where you would get into gigabits per second. Okay. And talk a little bit about what's going on in the spectrum world. Uh, th this this really right now is the spectrum that the wireless community has been looking at near term. Um, obviously, we're all probably familiar with what they're doing with broadcast, but outside of the broadcast band spectrum, um, this was all spectrum identified by by the executive branch of the government to, to try to transfer over to broadband wireless operation. Um, the AWS3 auction, which took place last year, set all those records. That's on this list. That's, um, that's 1755 to 1780 chunk of spectrum, which was paired with some, some other spectrum in the 2100 megahertz band, some satellite spectrum. But the next thing on this list here is this 3.5 gigahertz band spectrum. There's a lot of um, activity going along uh, with the FCC proceedings. There's some new technologies associated with the 3.5. So some of the new technologies targeted are unlicensed. Um, unlicensed LTE. That whole concept is, is hey, my Wi-Fi router will not only have a Wi-Fi radio in it, it will have an LTE radio. I'll plug it in. I'll put in my some kind of authentication credentials or SIM card. It will sync up to my wireless account, and, and it will be on it will it will be on Verizon's network, and all my you know I'll be on a closed network, and all all the same encryption and security and features I get on my Verizon service will be available um, inside my house where I might not have good coverage, and then I'll I'll be able to do hundreds of megabits per second. So uh, that's one of the technologies in play here. The other technology is uh, authorized shared access. The spectrum will be shared for um, uh, traditional, like Wi-Fi type access, completely unlicensed. Uh, the, then, uh, then there will be a, a higher authorization level that will take precedent over that. Um, and then there, and then there's a third level which will actually be like an auctioned government license type access level. So that. Um, 
that are, I'm sorry, that will be the second level, and then and then actually the highest level will be the incumbent users. So if the federal government needs that spectrum, then they'll be allocated that. The whole concept behind this is that there'll be a database where you essentially um, dip the database, but depending on what spectrum you need and what your access rights are, you'll negotiate with that database for an allocation of spectrum. So I, I think of it very similar to this DHCP, where you lease an IP address. Um, and you get an IP address, for, and then the lease expires, and then, then you've got to renegotiate it. So that's another new technology in that. Uh, the millimeter wave bands aren't on here at this point in time, but there are proceedings going on at the FCC now discussing millimeter wave bands. There's already a lot of jockeying position about which millimeter wave bands are. Ericsson loves the 15 gigahertz um, millimeter wave band. AT&T is very much working with um, Ericsson and supporting the 15 gigahertz band. Um, Samsung has been more around, operating around more like 23, 28 gigahertz. So they're very interested in that spectrum. Not, uh, and there's also talk about 60 gigahertz and 80 gigahertz, although that technology hasn't been demonstrated yet. Propagation models and channel soundings up in those bands are just now taking place. So there's still a lot of unknowns about how you would even deploy mobile wireless links up in, up in those spectrum bands. Okay. So how does this relate to broad, you know, Broadcasters. I think the way I think about um, what's going on here is, you know, the wireless carriers today don't have a business model that would fund this. Um, you know, the current business model isn't really going to work if they're going to invest this massive amount of capital. They're going to have to dr drive new revenues. So far, the most probably the most successful new business model they've had some good traction with. Are these uh, IoT devices? The internet, you know, and, and most of that is industrial telemetry. It's actually fairly narrow bandwidth type applications. Um, they're also having some inroads with more connected devices in the home, with tablets, uh, cars is, is, is a big area for them. So the vehicles. So if you if you go and look at uh, Verizon's analyst report and they talk about um, net new device activation, they no longer talk about subscriber editions. They talk about device activations um, because subscriber growth is anemic and they can't really report, <laughs> report it out, out that way without um, uh, kind of bringing to light some of the dilemmas they're in. But a, a lot of those are from new car sales with the LTE connected devices and the LTE just kind of like the HD radio thing. They, they, they get something from that. Um, tablets and then the, uh, the telemetry modems. A lot of the legacy telemetry modems still still use GSM because they were very low, very low bandwidth devices. So, so that's <clears throat> they've got to find business models uh, to build this stuff out. They don't they really don't have one that works today. Um, and and I, I think what broadcasters here have to do is they have to you know broadcasters are very interested in mobile TV, and mobile TV isn't really making any money for for the wireless carriers. So there's an opportunity there for some synergy. And I, I think the, um, the problem is, is, you know, how do you solve getting mobile TV receivers in wireless devices? And that's just not going to happen without strong cooperation. There's got to be some business partnerships and incentives to drive that, um, whether it's access to high-quality content. Uh, you know, you might have, might have the con you know, content producers such as ourselves might, um, might try to negotiate for the inclusion of mobile receivers if we give distribution rights. To our to our content, um, the, uh, the the other uh, aspect of this is based on current business models. There's a tremendous need to offload a lot of this video off off of the macro networks. In order to offload um, offload that broadcast offers offers some opportunities. So I, that's something I think there's an interest in the mobile world on how to do offload. Right now they're all focused on Wi-Fi offload. That's, that's their primary strategy. And then unlicensed LTE is another, another uh, offload strategy. But uh, if it's, you know, for multicast content streamed over a wide area, that, that big stick architecture, wide area coverage still has some capabilities that are, that are difficult to duplicate with other technologies. There's also opportunity for advertising and revenue sharing um, as content producers distribute more of their content over mobile networks. Um, there's the opportunity 
to do some some joint, you know, offer ad availability and ad insertion. You know, if I if I'm if Verizon's distributing my content, I might negotiate with them to allow them to insert some ads into my content in return for something. Um, so you know, in in that <clears throat> there, there's some business opportunities there. Uh, under regulatory, I don't you know the last thing, the, the the bullet point at the bottoms of some interest. I think um, if strict net neutrality gets implemented, um, then then the mobile operators are going to have a very tough time monetizing over the top services. And and they've tried to duplicate these services, and they're not having great success. You know, Verizon launched Go90, their own uh, video subscription service, last month, and you know you just haven't heard much at all about them having any traction with that product. You know. Talk about, but the, but you know they're still pushing, they're still investing in it, and it'll, it's an interesting experiment to see if any of the mobile operators will be able to develop their own over-the-top services. But right now, um, it, it's somewhat uh, they're having difficulty with it. So now, what their backup strategy is is um, they're going to offer a lot of them are trying to offer unlimited stream, unlimited streaming for like Netflix or other services based on some type of, of business relationship. And again, that, that unlimited streaming, though, creates CapEx issues for the wireless carriers. This kind of wraps it up, and then we can go into Q&A. Um, th this is more for broadcasters in terms of, you know, what should, mobile, what should broadcasters be thinking about as they think about mobile TV? And what are some of the technology choices that they have to think about in some of the business models? Um, so if I'm, a, if I'm a broadcaster, I want to have the ability to distribute content to smartphones, tablets, laptops, um, whether it be what we call non-real-time content or streaming content. Um, so I want to make sure that I can get receivers in a, you know, cost-effectively incorporated into those devices, integrated into the devices, or, or inexpensive dongles. Um, the technology must, you know, really has to support that to be successful. Um, I, I think the broadcast network technology should work, fair, you know, fairly seamlessly with mobile networks and Wi-Fi. So if I am watching mobile TV and I fall into a hole, I should, you know, the, the stream should seamlessly switch over to Wi-Fi if there's an available Wi-Fi connection, or seamlessly switch over to my mobile wireless connection. It might come out of my data bucket if it does that. But so if I, you know, so if I'm going into a fade or I, I lose the link momentarily, you have that second layer of robustness, and that's really important um, when you think about quality of service and, and mobile services. That's something the industry has only been doing for eh, maybe 10 years now. They, they've been layering their networks with different frequency bands that provide different levels of link robustness, and they dynamically switch between them. So when you're you're on a data session. You might start a download in the 700 megahertz band, or, or actually probably you know the 2 gigahertz band. You go inside of a building, you don't have the building uh, the building penetration loss forces you to downshift to 700 megahertz to get get that connection to maintain there. That's going to be very important in the millimeter wave bands too. You're going to have to be able to very quickly switch to these lower frequency bands when you lose those millimeter wave links because they will not they will not be high reliability links. So that's that's something that. Um, Broadcasters have to think about. Um, also, I think you know the technology has to be built with uh, to, to solve a solve that business problem for for wireless operators with the with their capex issues and the um, and the offload of these over the top services. So any any service that um, a wireless operator um, doesn't get any revenue for, maybe it's you know it's it's the free content. The free content would would be a good candidate for them to offload. Whereas their premium content, they're likely going to want to keep that on their networks. So when you look at the technology to enable some of these things, global standards are really important. That's one of the reasons why the, the, the mobile industry is so successful. They have global standards. They can manufacture chipsets in the billions. They can do full custom ASICs and, and really get good power consumption and, and uh, high performance in smartphones. You know, you're going to need to use very low cost manufacturing methods for a mobile receiver to make it um, attractive enough for laptop manufacturers to incorporate in their devices. Without global standards, it's going to be very difficult to do. 
Uh, so as much, you know, as much synergy as you can get from DVB-T2, as much synergy as you can get from some of the other standards, and, and make the, the silicon and software stack as, as, as common as possible. Uh, single frequency networks, I think, are an important technology. Um, you're, you, if you're going to make that mobile experience and, um, uh, and, and get the quality of service up to where you need, also to increase capacity. And I think another very important aspect right now, what is going on, is, is if you look at when, um, if ATSC3 goes to the regulators soon, is, um, you know, how are they going to set the um, planning factors? And uh, if they set the, if, if the regulators take the view of, oh, this is a remote, ro much more robust technology, um, we'll use our standard 30, um, 30 foot dipole. Uh, model and hey, now we only need 5 dB signal to noise ratio. We're going to crank all the, you know, crank the threshold down to 5 dB. Mobile services get tossed out the window in that kind of model. So I, you know, the, the numbers really need to go the other way for successful uh, mobile services. I think that's that's something that the industry has to be very careful. So uh, that's really the the end of my presentation. I don't know how we're doing on time. Hopefully, uh, okay. I think that's what you said about 30. 30 to 40 minutes, and then rest Q&A. So hopefully you guys have some questions for me. Also, um, I want to note, I've got um, Carl Lam is on the conference phone here. I'm not sure if everyone can hear him, but there were some questions I was sent ahead of time, a little bit more about um, you know, what kind of feedback we have for you about, about the product, what are we looking for in product. Carl would be a good ask. You know, if you have questions about product, and um, Carl would be a good, good person to address those topics. And um, we can cover anything like, like that along along the way as well. Hey, Jay. Yeah, um, you've talked about millimeter wave and, and frequency reuse and all the things that apply to the higher frequencies. Yet we've got auctions that are looking at the lower frequencies. And there are a lot of handicaps at, at the lower frequencies for the, for the wireless guys versus the broadcast. Uh, what, what's their view of the application of 600 megahertz? Well, so, so if you, we're getting into the. I, I want to be careful what I say because it's a quiet period. <laughs> be careful on this topic. But um, you know, there there are some wireless carriers who traditionally have not had any low band spectrum in their portfolio, and it and are at a, and operated a deficit. Oh, yeah, they, well, they operated a deficit. I mean, this is all public information, no secrets here. But they operated a deficit when trying to cover indoors, deep indoors, urban environments, and that's that's what becomes attractive. Now, you know, I've seen a lot of good, very good technical presentations from Qualcomm at ATSC about what happens to antenna efficiency when you get below 600 and the difficulties of incorporating antennas. Okay. I, I'd be cautious about saying that the industry isn't going to want to go any lower, because if you look at what's driving a lot of their growth now, it's connected vehicles, um, and they have gateways in them. And if I'm if I'm AT and T and I want to provide good, robust service on the highways in rural areas between towns, I'm like, oh, 400 megahertz with vehicle, you know, you get a 20 dB improvement in link budget by putting the antenna on the roof of that that car. And now they can do 15, 30 mile cell radius, and cut that capex way down. So I mean, I wouldn't say that. Now, the capacity is a tiny fraction of what you'll get the higher frequency bands. But in rural areas that are very lightly populated, um, they're, they're, you know, they, they might target it. I'm not, I, I haven't heard of you know Right now, I don't think there's a whole lot of interest in those lower frequencies, you know, going down lower in frequency. But it could happen if particularly if this vehicle, connected vehicle craze continues to grow and people start complaining about you know, when I'm in in the middle of the desert, in between Las Las Vegas and Los Angeles, I can't stream Netflix. You got to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jeff. What, what's Univision's view of uh, hybrid technologies such as uh, LTEA plus uh, multiplex with uh, uh, ATS3 or DVB-T2 on this on a common transmitter? Um, I, you know, that's really not anything we've thought about at this point in time, where you have all those on the same. I mean, I, we, if you, I think we've thought about it from this perspective. You're talking about, hey, 
what's our view of being able to transmit L traditional LTE type frames on an ATSC transmitter? It, you know, play, access it with the bootstrap. Yeah, time division multiplex them. Um, I, I think the view of that is is um, if that's all you know, if that's all the silicon and the handset's going to support, then it's something we're going to have to take take a hard look at. I, I think the ideal situation is obviously getting mobile um, receivers to support the full standard. But if you if, if you can't, that's a good that's a good option to think about. And obviously, ATSC three you know um, waveform gives you the flexibility to, to drop those frames in there. It can. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> These business models can get very complex, and it, it all. So, for example, if I'm um, if I'm just web browsing and I go to you know the Yahoo homepage, and they auto launch some video just when I hit the web page, that's going to come out of my data bucket. Yeah. So, and right now, I, um. Yeah, because Yahoo's monetizing that, and and Verizon's not getting. Well, they get money from your data. I think you have to look at um, data buckets are getting bigger, and the cost per bit's coming down. So, and they feel really lucky if they can tread water. <laughs> you know, hey, I know, I know. In the next five, so I mean, if you look at the next five years, yeah, I don't know. It might be a. A 6x, you know, they expect consumers to increase data consumption by 6x. Um, they're not expecting to get 6x times the revenue. I mean, they're, they're probably expecting to maybe get a 2 or 3% increase in revenue a year at, at best from, from a 6 times increase in data consumption, which drives a massive capital investment. You know, that could, that could be $800 to $1,000 of capital per subscriber if they're going to increase usage by 6 times. And... The, yeah, the consumers. Just as they, just as they, as the types of applications that are becoming popular and download. So, let's talk a little bit about a Facebook user. What, what did, a, a mobile Facebook user? What did they use last year versus what they're going to be using five or six years? So, Facebook now has a lot of video. It's adding a lot of video. So, I mean, last year you probably didn't watch. You may not have watched any video on Facebook. Five or six years from now, you'll be, you might be watching three or four hours a month worth of video on your Facebook feed. Some of that videos are going to be advertisements because, you know, Facebook's going to be pushing ad. You know, they always put, insert ads in the feed. So that's going to be a big driver. Um, people are connecting more devices to their phone. They're connecting their, you know, most of these devices have Wi-Fi hotspots in them. So they, when they're traveling, they connect their laptops. Um, what about... The, what about uh, TV receivers that have LTE chipsets built into them? You know, I'm, I don't, I, particularly when you talk to 5G, that's something I'm sure that will happen. You know, you go bring that big screen home; it'll have an, it'll have a, it might have a 5G chipset in there. You turn it on, and Verizon's over-the-air service is going to pop up on the screen and say, "Just you know, put in your subscriber information, and you can start watching Verizon's content right on your TV." I, I, yeah. Not those six Um, there are the statistics out there on that breakdown are available. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. I do know that historically, if you go back and look the last few years, most of the almost all the data was consumed while you were stationary. Um, it was all, yeah, and it was it was largely data was largely all consumed indoors. Voice was largely all consumed outdoors. Um, so the networks were, you know, there was a mismatch in the way network planners had built these networks. They weren't really designed. Um, and when you move, when you move a user indoor, there's a big capacity penalty you get because the the signal to noise ratio is much lower indoors. Um, so that that's what's driving a lot of the small cell deployments is to address that particular problem. Is data is primarily consumed indoors while you're stationary. But but the you know data consumption while highly mobile, particularly with these telematics and connected vehicles, is growing pretty quickly. So it's it's becoming more of a... Your purpose, the designated 
mobile applications or push rather uh, the, the consumption of the stationary from the stationary board to mobile, right? Yeah, you are seeing. I mean, you're you're seeing a big growth in stationary usage, and growth uh, with high mobility is 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 very is growing very fast as well. So the high the high mobility piece of it is. New technology, the technology for future interviews. Uh, where do you see the biggest but easiest growth in stationary or mobile? Um, stationary is going to be easier to grow than mobile because. These, these millimeter wave technologies aren't going to be very useful for mobile connections. I mean, the, the cell sizes are so small, the handoff speeds, are, and, and then the, 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 complex, the complexity of the, the, the propagation environment in millimeter wave bands when you're moving. This, these are pedestrians. You know, 5G is for pedestrian speeds, cube farm. And again, wireless networks are built in layers. You, you hop up and down between these layers seamlessly. You don't know you do it. You know, as as your usage changes. So if I'm um, if I'm commuting in from um, you know up, if I'm commuting in from Long Island into Manhattan, when I'm on that train, I might uh, you know I'm probably on the on the two gigahertz band, and then when I hit a tunnel, I probably drop down to the 700 megahertz band because it's much easier to propagate through that tunnel on the lower frequencies. Um, then when I get into the city, when these other layers are built. You'll, and, and I get off the train at the plat. I'm standing on the platform. I'm relatively stationary. The hot spot on the platform. I'll be up in the millimeter wave band. So, so you just continually migrate through these these layers. Public transportation. Can you give public transportation as an example of people using a lot of bandwidth, right? Because they are simply not doing anything. Right. They're sitting there, so they can, they, they can spend their time uh, on browsing. Okay. So, in your opinion. From from the um, uh, from the person who would like to propagate to, to to increase to extend those services, public transportation is where you want all the people to be, right? It, well, you could build a much lower cost network if you only had this if you only had to serve. So, I mean, the cost gets very high when you try to offer ubiquitous coverage, and that's one of the reasons why you know mobile carriers like having a portfolio of spectrum in multiple bands because they can deploy the spectrum that's most optimal when you're out in the highway in the middle of nowhere, um, trying to you know trying to do, trying to serve that link in the two gig band is a lot more difficult than it is in the low frequency band. My point is yeah. that um, if the person is inside of his car and he's driving, he's not going to be using much of a bandwidth. Radio is is as much as he can do. Well, if he's got an if okay, this is where you get into these futurist use cases. Uh, so, what if his vehicle is, is being piloted automatically, and he's sitting in the back seat, or hopefully, you know, he's doing some work while he's going to Chicago, <laughs> or taking a nap? <laughs> but I mean, that—that's where you get into those types. Of, now, also, the other thing is, is the bandwidth required just to navigate a vehicle autonomously. That requires a lot of bandwidth. So you're gonna, you know, as a wireless operator, um, hey, that. That vehicle is going to need constant map updates. It's going to need to know information on construction. It's going to need updates when there's um, accidents. It's probably, you know, there might be a real-time video feed going from a camera on the device uh, to help to help some navigation function at a centralized server, like Google Voice does. Google Voice today, um, that audio is processed in their server so they can do better speech recognition. So you might be capturing video, sending it up stream and getting instructions back about uh, you know road conditions or how to navigate yeah what is the innovation see uh, the impact of uh, as there's more, more frequency sharing and closer adjacencies between wireless services over the air DTV you've got mobile uh, smartphone devices coming in close proximity to over the air DTV receivers uh, we already have that problem there? We already have. <laughs> we already have. Um, there's, you know, there's definitely a much higher potential for interference among devices. Electromagnetic compatibility is an issue, and it start actually the wireless industry is paying attention to it. Um, the wireless industry has pretty most of these, and in the last five years, almost all the national carriers added dedicated interference and spectrum management teams to the local markets. So they have local engineers now 
whose sole job function it is to hunt down interference. That did, when, I, when I started in that industry, nothing like that existed. The interference problems just weren't that. They, they happened, but they weren't that common. Now they have full-time engineers running around looking for interference. Um, and uh, some of them are regional. Some of them are, are local in the bigger markets. So th those issues continue to grow. Um, the, the wireless industry is aware of it. Broadcast industry is aware of it. A lot of users of electromagnetic spectrum are starting to push the FCC to take a more serious look at this, get a little bit better at you know, managing part 15 devices, part 18 devices, grow lights, or you know, you hear about all the well, time. I can assure you the FCC pack is way into this right now. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. But, you know, it, the interference and what, yeah. and, what, what I see the FCC doing is just enabling a set of rules. They're not going to be out there playing cop. They're just going to try to enable a set of rules, and they're going to look to the industry to enforce it. And, you know, the, the tier one carriers and, and the broadcasters have a lot of money tied up in their spectrum. So they're expecting us to enforce the rules, but we, we need to work together. They can put they can put the regulatory scheme in place to manage it, but we're going to have to we're going to have to be the ones but, who but enforce it. Back to the original it. question: You, as your yeah, over-the-air viewers, are maybe using inside antennas yeah. uh, as opposed to external antennas. It's going to be noisier world. <laughs> yeah, going to be a lot of adjacent. That's that's why SFNs that's why SFNs start to become more. And the SFNs are going to be a, going to be difficult because uh, steering technology if yeah, if I want to put an SFN up and I want to put a transmitter out towards the um, towards the edge of my contour, and there happens to be an adjacent channel, I'm going to start interfering with the adjacent channel near my, unless they put one in, unless they put a transmitter where I'm putting mine. So there's a much you know, much greater need for cooperation and coordination among broadcasters. So, TR, uh, kind of a companion uh, question to this. Um, with Repack, the FCC has released their uh, band plans, which all incorporate guard bands between the wireless services and the broadcast services. Up in the wireless segment, and they're variable. <laughs> you have a duplex gap yeah. of 11 megahertz to allow you guys to. Former business to transmit and receive simultaneously. The, the one thing, and I happen to be part of the FCC's planning conference when they when they had, had this, we had wireless guys and broadcast guys, was the fact that um, trying to share spectrum in various areas was going to be a problem. The wireless guys were adamant about that. The broadcast guys were adamant about it. Yet the FCC has turned around and said, in many markets where there will be insufficient spectrum to repack the stations, we're going to have impaired spectrum, and we're going to start placing broadcast stations in either guard bands or duplex gaps. What's your, your feedback on that? Well, I think kind of my view on that is is that uh, you know. Someone's going to purchase that spectrum. Then they're going to go and download the latest version of OET 74 and do some analysis and say, oh, these protection requirements are going to prohibit me from operating. I've got to, I got to get that broadcaster out of there. <laughs> well, that's where, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's where, uh, where, where you might see, um, uh, you know, typically, some broadcasters are electing to, you know, electing to go off the air. That's an option for them. So I think that's as bro broadcasters will be faced with that. Is this wireless operator going to write me a big enough check that would entice me to go off the air? But in the auction, I mean, we, we you go back to that first slide: 184 billion a year in revenues and 32 billion a year in capex. It's a big industry. Buying a few stations isn't isn't that tough for them. In, in the auction, the only reason why they run out of spectrum in the remaining UHF bands. If you've got broadcasters that are adamant about staying on the air in that spectrum, it's just to put you there. They'll continue. I mean, if the broadcaster wants, the broadcaster has a right to continue to operate there for as long as they want. I, 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 think, I think that right's pretty sacrosanct, and I don't think, you know, the, wire, the, the, the spectrum owner will either have to abide by the rules or find some way of working a deal with the the broadcaster. Do you have any thoughts on what the clearing target will be? I don't.
don't have any <laughs> good thoughts for that. Um, you know, there's, I would just look at the public. Yeah, yeah, there's some fairly smart analysts out there studying it. I don't even want to, even if I did have one, I wouldn't say it right now. <laughs> Yes. So what uh, kind of traction do you see with DM and DMS uh, type applications? Okay. Progress has been very slow. This technology has actually been around for a very long time. This, you know, when I was yeah, when I was doing network planning, I think I first saw it in 2011, 2012. Um, I saw demonstrations of it at least in 2012. Um, the progress has been very slow. I think there's been um, a realization by the wireless operators that it is a little harder to aggregate enough users on a cell sector watching the same watching the same non-time shifted real-time stream simultaneously to flip them over to multicast mode. Uh, the other the other thing they've tried is to distribute their own content in multicast mode and get people to watch it. I, I think I think their their plan for that is is I got to get a viable streaming service up and running first, and once I get some customers watching my content, then I can worry about trying to multicast it. They don't even have unicast customers. They don't have enough. Yeah. Now, the first AT and T with distributing Directv content may have something going. You know, because they, you know, AT and T has said publicly that um, they plan to allow. DirecTV subscribers to stream, a, you know, DirecTV content for free, not not going against their data plan. Now, obviously, there'll be terms of use, or you know, I don't know what the terms of service are, but they are giving some incentive. If you if you're a DirecTV subscriber, you're an AT&T wireless subscriber, you'll get access to content. And of course, they got to work around the net neutrality rules, and that's how that's going to play out. FTR, uh, along those lines, too, um, you know, I'm an AT&T mobile subscriber, and part of their thing, the bundle, is to uh, uh, unlimited data. We'll go back to unlimited data. If you, if you get DirecTV and your AT&T wireless, we'll, we'll make you an unlimited data asterisk. Oh, over 2 gigabytes will throttle you. <laughs> <laughs> but keep, keep in mind when you say, yeah, I mean, that's how, the, I mean, I'm a T-Mobile subscriber. That's how T-Mobile's data plans always work. There are, they have no overage charges. You hit your limit and it slows down. And you can you always call them up and say, "I want another gig," but you slow down to 150 kilobits per second, which is enough for your email to work and and messaging apps work fine, but everything else is broken. And perhaps to add to Kayer's question, um, you know, Verizon is perhaps unique in the EMVMS possibility space with their exclusive NFL contract. Um, do you know of or have seen any analytics on during the NFL season? Verizon's ability to how many users in a cell? Like I said, the only thing I ever saw was there was a paper published in one of the IEEE um, journals analyzing data traffic at the two. It was a 2013 Super Bowl, uh, and Verizon had a whole pile of small cells. They had they had multicast service up and running, and um, they only averaged two to three connections to the videos. You know, to the multicast service. Oh, Everything else, they had a huge amount of data, but everything else was time shifted, streaming type stuff, and it couldn't it couldn't be multicast. It had to go unicast. So that was that's to some extent you got to change consumer behaviors and viewing habits to get multicast to work better in a mobile environment. But it doesn't there's some challenges with it. So again, Verizon last week talking about EMBMS. We you know we see a future for EMBS EMBS EMBS. Um, in um, in telematics, distributing software updates for the car manufacturers, so they don't have you know. I guess if you if you have a v diesel VW, you can get your <laughs> you get, get your new firmware. <laughs> so I've never seen a price electricity problem. Meaning you know I have a father with four lines. I see my bill going up and up and up. And the next call I make is to my kids saying, cut the shit out, <laughs> or I'm going to cut you off. So yeah, I mean, economics can't work, right? If they're going to invest another $400 billion for 5G, is it going to work with price elasticity, or are they going to have to seal cable bandwidth for wireless home? 
The, well, one of the one of the use cases for 5G is is that you dump your wireline. You don't need a wireline anymore. Is there enough money there? Yeah, you know, what's a another 40, 50 bucks a month that they, you know, you're, they they see that 40 or 50 dollar share of wallet, and they're going to try to get a chunk of that. To some extent, they're cannibalizing their own business too. So, but but you got to keep in mind, AT&T and Verizon are primary primarily DSL broadband providers and DSL copper based is getting its you know you know having its lunch eaten right now so cannibalizing DSL is probably something I don't worry about too much yes voice is transitioning to LTE that that is going a little bit slower than operators would like it to primarily Software maturity. I mean, these are pretty complex. Um, you know, if you know anything about the um, the architecture for voice over LTE, it has a you know it separates the control plane from the data plane. Um, there's a lot of issues of synchronizing control messages with the actual um, data plane path. So there's been a lot. You know, software maturity has been a has been a big issue with the technology. But it's technically it's it's out there. It's well it's well deployed. It's growing. I think the other thing you will see is once what look what I would look for in that case is if you as this technology matures, um, once you have Volte in place, voice over Wi-Fi is almost seamless. It's just you have all the infrastructure in place to do do voice over IP and and uh, manage all the services regardless of what the access network is. So someone's switching from Wi-Fi to, and that will be coming. I, I actually, T-Mobile, I think, has already announced that um, they've had voice over Wi-Fi for many years, but it doesn't do handover. You walk out your front door and you drop the call. And they've now, they've been deploying Volte for at least a year. They're going to integrate those two services so that you will be able to, your calls will be moved between voice over Wi-Fi and Volte. You also just have to switch to a yeah, the IMS systems have, are, are, have been in place. All of them have their IMS platforms. It's just a matter of getting those platforms stable and scale. They're very complex software architecture. So the first thing you try to do is get them in there, get them stable, get the quality of service up, and then you got to scale them. And that's all. That's kind of the that's kind of the technology life cycle in the in the mobile space. 